call me old man waves. Damn you, old man! Wade. And welcome to the Old Man Wade Show. I am your host, the guy of stuff and the Lord of Laughter, Old Man Wade. I'm sitting here with my lovely life, the Valkyrie. Hey. With her normal enthusiasm, as always. Uh, we got a special guest in here, somewhat, well, not in here. She's at home social distancing uh, because, you know, the COVID-19 is still an actual thing. Uh, why don't you tell everybody who you are? Hello, my name is Lauren Shear. I'm a friend of uh, Old Man Wade here via our shared comic book store. He and my husband have patronized... Uh, Comicopia in Kenmore for a while, and it's a great little store. Please check them out whenever they are able to. They're they're fantastic. It's like a family there, and uh, I've learned many uh, important facets of geekdom through my husband and through <laughs> Comicopia. So I feel like I've kind of gotten grandfathered into that. Uh, well, inducted into that uh, world a bit better, even though I've I'm a geek way back. Thanks to Star Wars, X Files, etc. So yeah, I feel like I'm, I was outside the comic book world, but now I'm definitely much more apprised of it. It's funny. I didn't know you were into Star Wars. I knew the. I feel like I knew the X Files. Oh, I was crazy about Star Wars. I mean, my my Instagram handle is Leia's Legacy eighty four. That's for a reason. How did I, I, she how was did like I not pick first. up on that? I, I mean, it was sci-fi but it was also funny and like the acting was pretty natural and just because of Carrie she was just natural she was amazing I loved her um what was I gonna say so it was funny the first time I met you we were at um Pride Parade and I feel like you were the mother of dragons I remember you had the egg and that was before I even knew what Game of Thrones was yeah that was my first Pride it was so great yeah, like, and I, I built that dress around a bra, and I was very self-conscious the whole time. The people kept saying it looked good, even though I had, like, whip-stitched some fabric onto a bra. And managed to have Khaleesi's really just janky version of her wedding dress. <laughs> it was still dope, it was, it was still a great day. How did you hold an egg for, like, like that for, like, hours? It was styrofoam. Uh, it was like nothing. But even still, holding it. It was spray like, painted green, like not spray painted, but painted green styrofoam. It's the easiest gesture, just cup and egg. Yeah, but it you, was very easy. But you actually like held it up, like you had it like, you know, like on display. It wasn't Oh there's there's harder tasks yeah, by far. Yeah. I could trade off hands, that's toss true. it in the back of the truck. You know what's not difficult? Um, it's not difficult to not be an asshole and donate a bunch of money to Fuckboy 45's um, campaign. Well said. So you know what? Fuck it. Let's get right into it. <laughs> so actually, um, a friend of the show uh, on a podcast, I will find his name in a second because I don't want to like, um, I want to make sure he gets credit for it. But he sent me an article about uh, Marvel, the Marvel, um, one of the Marvel chairmen donated a bunch of money to um, the Fuck War 45's campaign. Um, I don't want to butcher his name. Um, I, I want to say his first name is Tanas. Uh, if I butchered the name, I, I deeply apologize. And send me an email and let me know how to properly pronounce it. But thank you for sending the article. Um, it's about uh, Marvel Entertainment's billionaire chairman is donating big bucks to Trump. Uh, Marvel Entertainment chairman Ike uh, Pelmutter has long been close to the Trump uh, to the Trump camp. It has already turned on a fundraiser tab for 2020. According to CNBC, uh, Paul Martin and his wife have given $360,000 to a Trump Victory Joint Fundraising Committee, ranking them among the campaign's top donor. Uh, during the 2018 cycle, uh, Paul Martin, who was worth an estimated $5.2 billion, and his wife donated over $2 million to um, conservative candidates and organization. He's also considered part of the what ProPublica called mar lago crowd. Do you know what that is? Mar-a-Lago crowd. Uh, Mar-a-Lago is his uh, is Trump's uh, crappy little golf hotel thing down in Mar-a-Lago, Florida. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that, that shit. No wonder I erased that from my mind. But yeah, long story <laughs> short is uh, that a- 
asshole donated um, a ton of money to um, an unworthy cause um, that's been causing uh, racism and sexism and homophobia uh, for over, for longer than he's actually been in office. So um, this came as, it didn't really come as a shock because um, a lot of billionaires are going to be billionaires and they're going to support their buddies so they can get tax breaks and not get um, hit equally with um, things and they get special favors and so on and so forth. So I'm pretty sure nobody, nobody listening right now is shocked by that. I think the shocking part is is that the Marvel name is on it. Uh, Valkyrie, do you have any comments on that oh, about like just that? What we're just I'm just fine in general. I mean, not any more so than anybody else. Um, in like what people have been saying in general, like I don't understand how people still support Trump with everything that he has said and done. Yeah. Um, I understand being conservative, and that's your prerogative to believe that, I don't know, Jesus rules the world or whatever the fuck theory it is that they have. Yeah. That is your right, your ability, and your whatever, but to say that you are not racist or that you love everyone equally, but then to donate to a man that is outwardly racist and provoking violence against people of color, trans people, against the gay community, like, literally about against anyone that is not white, male, or wealthy. Like, for me, it's problematic, and I feel like it should be problematic for everyone. Yeah. So, uh, Lauren, your thoughts? Absolutely, I agree. And it especially bothers me. One thing, I'm... Like, I was raised Jewish, and that's a part of my identity, even though I'm not religious. It's a cultural thing more than anything else. My parents were, like, very, were very reformed. There's a lot about Judaism that I don't really know a lot about. The more intense parts of it, like uh, Orthodox or Hasidic life, I, I feel like I could never live those lives because I'm not religious. But when I see Jewish people, and my uncle was one of them, he voted for Trump, but I will never forgive him because... I, my his father, my grandfather, got shot down fighting and like was a prisoner of war, fighting the Nazis. These are the people who tried to exterminate us. And for any Jewish person to back Trump in any way, and for wealth reasons, that is like living up to all the anti-Semitic propaganda that has always been per perpetrated against us, saying that we only care about money or. Israel or whatever, and that's like living up to the worst possible things that people could say about us and showing that you've not learned from our history at all, and you don't understand that this is fascism, and it's just, it makes me, one of the things that makes me so angry, it's like when my grandmother found out that Bernie Madoff was Jewish and that he cheated, like, the Holocaust survivors, that's like the, the shame that someone of your people could do something like this and harm other people so much it's just the level of disgust i can't even express it so and you you, you were both right and he should be chastised for this and when someone asked me they was like well why don't you cancel marvel i'm like my problem is it's there are also a lot of writers and creators of color who need that who need that support and i'm at a crossroad where i'm like but does it make it right you know what i mean um, you have somebody like Vita Ayala, who I who I love and support. You have uh, Reznor Hudlin, who I love and support. Uh, you have writers like Jason Aaron, um, who makes it a point to bring up uh, issues that women have, and, and lets it clear that he doesn't like know what they're going through. But like, hey, this is the best I can do with my platform. Uh, you have uh, Jewish writers, Spanish writers, trans writers, gay writers, creators, and all that. And it's like they're under this umbrella. And for me, the difficult is canceling somebody, like canceling Marvel, when it's like, the how does the trickle down effect? Like, it's like, sure, my uh, X amount of money a month is not even, it's not even a drop in the bucket. Like, you know what I mean? It's barely steam in the bucket. So, how would you, how? But 
Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So that statement's not true, right? Like your drop in the bucket is just a little piece, but all those little pieces make up the funds that they're using to. Yes. To like support this campaign. So I understand the feeling of, oh, I don't want to not support my writers, my like those my people of color, my the people that are for gay rights and trans rights and are for everyone having equality and just living their own lives and minding their business. Like um my feeling with it is is I don't want to not support those people, but I also don't want to watch my money and Marvel makes millions off of people going to see their movies millions. and see that you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to watch that money get sent to a, a, a cause that is openly and blatantly racist, homophobic, sexist. Like, I just, to me, if I were those writers, I would fucking leave. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, like, I would just leave. I would start my own shit. <laughs> like... How yeah. many how many different writers in there w would get up and just walk out and leave? Like how many of those writers that you're talking about would would like like how how important would that be? It's kind of like when people were talking about the uh, the, uh, the NBA going back to play, right? They're Which supposed to start, terrible they're idea. supposed to start. For me, I don't think they should start because all that is a distraction. So people have something else to look at instead of what is happening right now. And for me. I, if I were in the NBA, I would be taking a stance and be like, no, I'm not doing this until all this is switched, situated and all this is figured out. Like money is not, I guess for me, money is not a motivation motivator for me. I will find another way to make a dollar. I don't need things. I don't need stuff. I need actions. I need people to be willing to fight for those who can no longer fight for themselves in every community around the world. Like, People just being senselessly murdered for their beliefs or how they look or just wanting to live their own life and, and, and not be bothered. Like, I just can't support that. Like, I, I am canceling fucking everything. Like, if you support the Trump campaign, I'm not with you. I'm not shopping at your store. I'm not drinking your coffee. I'm not eating your food. I'm not buying your books. No. <laughs> well, the other thing about that is that like, you have like the Wendy's, like they when they came to cancel Wendy's, where it's not like it's the same thing with Marvel. Like one of their chairmen's not su is supporting them, but you have other ones who are not. So like, where so Lauren, like where do you? And I agree with everything she said because realistically, like yes, if I spend, we'll say, uh, five thousand dollars a year, it may it may be a drop in the bucket, but if everyone who's putting in five thousand dollars a year does that it does have an effect so Lauren what would you what are your feelings on like supporting like even though it may not be every chairman but it's just like you know what I mean but that money still goes to them what are your feelings on that I'm very torn because like it's not like saying oh, I'm never gonna watch a Woody Allen movie or a Roman Polanski movie again I'm gonna make sure they never get my money because that's just one person yes they have people working under them but I mean should they be working for Woody Allen or Roman Polanski no. But this is a different case. Yeah. Those people have, who work at Marvel have gotten in there and they probably didn't know about this, but they have since been able to build a career and it's certainly not on them to have to cut ties with the thing that makes them able to publicize their work. But if they are able to, if they're known well enough in their own right, then maybe they could go independent, find another distributor, maybe. Yes. Uh, maybe do, but then they might lose the right to work with the characters they've been working with because those are an IP that Marvel might own. I'm not going to pretend I know a lot about all this and how that, I just imagine that's how it works. But if there were, there are things like Patreon where you could back artists or like just Venmo artists, specifically them, but then again, how many people are going to go out of their way and find all the artists that they like and do that? Well, I mean, then again, comic, the comic book crowd, crowd, if anyone, is going to have the like care and fandom to find their chosen artists and back them. I think if any crowd could do that, the comic book fans could. And it's funny, you bring up a good point about like Patreon, and um, that's something that's actually become super popular, especially around the, um, with the pandemic going on. You have uh, uh, yeah. wrestlers, um, comedians, um, strippers who are all like, well, I can provide <laughs> you a service, um, 
but you know I'm not going to provide the service for free. So they they give you a Patreon yeah. and it'll give you like extra like behind the scenes footage. Like uh, there's a woman I interviewed, uh, Sarah the Rebel, who's a um, she's a wrestler in um, woman of wrestling in Las Vegas, and she has a Patreon. And she was um, during the interview she talked about how she does like uh, short stories. She offers. Uh, signed pictures from exclusive uh, photo shoots that she does, and like she does, she does really well. Um, podcast that I listen to, the Whiskey Brothers, they offer like specific things for doing that. Um, there's a ton of IG models, and like I said, strippers and porn stars who do the same thing. Who, if you want to support them, you can you know give directly to the creator. So there, so that is an actual thing. But I, but um, to your sense, it's like I also wonder when you have a billion dollar corporation who has this pull. The difficult thing is now is like, do they get blackballed for mm-hmm. um, speaking up? So like you'll have a guy like um, there's um like for example, one guy did something really nasty. I'm not gonna say this artist's name, but he said something. He um put something in um, X-Men Gold that was uh, in his religion, but it was super sexist. And he thought he was going to get away with it, someone caught it, and then he said, well, this is my religion, I should have the freedom to say whatever I want. And it's like, yeah, you do, but you also have, they also have the right to say, fuck you, we're not going to use your art anymore. Um, And so that's on a much more extreme level, but let's say you have someone, like let's say Old Man Wade writes on Marvel decides to go to Twitter and say, hey, fuck the CEO, or, like, you know, I don't support what the CEO does, I get fired, and then it's like, DC Comics now doesn't want to work with me. Um, Image doesn't want to work with me, because now I have this um, image of people going, like, he's difficult to work with, but then it's a matter of, like, where does my integrity lie? And to, to my wife's point, money isn't everything. So, like, you know, it's, it's a difficult, and we're in a difficult and strange place where, like, you can have that integrity because there are other avenues to make money. Yeah, well, and my other thing is, too, imagine if all the people that work for that company collectively just literally flat out stood up and spoke out about it mm-hmm. and said something. Well, people have been waiting for, like, they, let's say the NFL, for example. Ugh. People have been waiting. <laughs> people have been waiting. We can say, fuck the NFL. But I don't people, watch football. I never liked football, and I never will watch either. football. Um... For a sport that is 90% of color, their stance on all of this shit has been so disgusting and gross that I still would never support them. And it's funny because, like, now all of a sudden, it's like, oh, now I get it. Oh, now you get it. (laughs) Yeah, but it's not like, now I get it, I apologize for being a piece of shit. It's just like, okay, let's throw out a statement because we don't want to lose our black players and we don't want to lose our... Black dollar. Our black dollar. Like, and that's my whole thing with, like, not giving my money to these things. Because that's, so, I can protest, I can hold signs, I can speak until I'm blue in the face, and and it will fall on deaf ears still. And some people will realize and some people won't. What hurts government, what hurts people of wealth, what hurts those companies is losing money. If you lose my money, you're fucked. You have no choice but to change your position and change what you're doing if the masses refuse to touch your stuff. And that's what happened during the civil rights movement, right? That whole bus boycott went on for a year. We can't do anything for a freaking week. It went on for a year and it hurt. They lost a lot of fucking money because people of color were the ones taking their buses to get to and from work. Things changed because people refused to do things, and things changed because people boycott, because people stop giving a fuck, because people realize that their money is going to a corrupt system, and they're and they're and they're giving it to them freely. I just I just personally, and I get like I said, I get why you're still gonna read your comics and you're still gonna do whatever. I get that, but for me, personally, I will not spend my money somewhere knowing that they're bashing full communities, not even just people of color, like, people in general, like... Well, it's also a funny thing, it's also not funny, but, like... Back the Republican Party, back, if you're a Republican, back the Republican Party, but do do not back a racist bigot, a 
unless you are racist well, or sexist or homophobic. You you have to be those things to be able to vote for that man. I'm sorry. It's the only it is the only logical thing. And if you are, are, are concerned about having your party represented repre represented, then you should have thought about that before him being your only option for running. Well, the other thing about it is, is that you also have, like, um, and Lauren, you can testify to this as well, uh, Marvel, the writers and everything, they don't hide back how they feel about it. And I've also noticed that, like, they don't, like, the writers and stuff, they will not um, fight the um, urge to, like, say that they, they think this guy is disgusting. I remember Ben Grimm was on a, is in a comic book, and uh, someone was like, he's like, I'm Ben Grimm, I'm the thing, the second most popular orange monster in the country. So it's, it's it's difficult and like it's like they are making a stand, but then again it's like it's we're in a really disgusting time where like you really have to like stand up and be accounted for, and you know what I mean. And it's like you can say it's one thing to say something; it's another to actually like do it. Do it, yeah. And I think that's yeah. I think that's important, especially in twenty twenty because people dismiss things so quickly. Like, look at how quickly this whole movement is is starting to now just diminish, right? We're not seeing as much in the news because they're done, because nobody's rioting and nobody's looting. And they're done criminalizing every black person in America and making a whole protest about it being just a bunch of criminals doing bad shit. Like, see, look at what these black people do and incite. But and they don't have that anymore. And But nobody wants to to put out news about the positive shit that is happening, about the protests that are happening peacefully, beautifully, like where people are coming to speak, where people are coming together. Nobody wants to, like media has, it's dropped. And, and, and all I keep on hearing from, from white people who say that they're not, like, not, and, and you I don't, don't mean this don't as a broad spectrum you, 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 you of all white said, people. Said it's people. these specific people yeah. who say that they understand why people are upset, but then in the breath, same breath keep on saying, enough is enough, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I'm sorry you don't want to deal with love... this anymore, Becky, but I would also <laughs> love not to deal with the fact that every time my husband leaves my house, I'm terrified that he could possibly be mistaken for someone that's a a criminal standing at the bus stop minding his business getting ready to go to work at 11 o'clock at night like I understand that this is so painful and hard for you to swallow and digest because God forbid like you have to hear somebody tell you that somebody else's life is more important than you having stuff or doing things like I just for me it's just I I just don't want to watch all of this blow over. Well, this was the problem. And, um, so Lauren, you, um, you protest. You go out, you march, yeah, you I, make sure the people's voices I are I feel heard. like the least I can do is offer my presence and follow the lead of the people of color who have been in this fight much longer than I have and just follow their guidance and be of service however I can. And I won't pretend I'm brave enough to go be as one of my favorite comedians, Jackie Cation, puts it, a white lady meat shield, and I put myself between <laughs> the cops and protesters, which I wish I could do. I want to be that, but Will would, A, I would have a panic attack if a cop, like, took me in and I was in prison, and Will would freaking lose his shit. He was, he was nauseous all day the day I went to one a couple weeks ago, that mass um, action against police brutality yes. put on outside City Hall, and there was a huge police presence all around there. There were no interactions that I heard about or saw at all, yeah. fortunately. But, um, I mean, of course, when the large body of people tend to disperse, then they start going in and picking after people sometimes. But it was re relatively early, and I kept assuring Will, I know this area, I could walk home from there if needed, and... I had observed the lessons of the previous big protest in Boston that got a attacked by the cops. And, like, the tea stations were shut down and people were kettled onto Newbury Street. And what did they think was going to happen? They were, like, begging for looting and rioting to take place because they're kettling panicked people on this street. And there's going to be some people amongst a massive crowd who are going to 
and so I don't know, just, and it's not nearly as important. Chanel or fucking Burberry have insurance. Yeah, they'll be fine. I don't care about Burberry. I mean, I thought I cared about Trident because that's a local bookstore and leave, leave that alone. But again, it's not as important as people getting murdered in the street. So I, I might have wandered off the topic. I'm, no, my ADHD will do that, but... Anyway, feel free to divert me back to whatever we were talking about. But no, it's all, it falls yes, under... Yes, I, I go to protests. <laughs> but yeah, it falls under the same umbrella. And like, you may not know the uh, the uh, suffering or what a, a black man or black woman may go through, but you're a woman. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not you're not treated fairly at all. You may be a white woman, but you're also a white Jewish woman. Like, you know what I mean? So yeah. there there is a struggle for you in general. And before um, you were doing this, you were um, at the rallies for women's rights when Fuckboy was, um, you know, doing what he, when he first started, his first major thing was being sexist, you know what I mean? Uh, and not acknowledging the things it's that are everything all at once. Yeah. I mean, he's been racist since before I was born. Yeah. He's been a slumlord since before I was born. He's been a, yeah. He's, he's, been a, he's been a, he's been a piece of shit forever. Yeah. And, and you know what's funny about it is, is, um, I remember, I see, I, I vividly remember Method Man's second album uh, he was on Method Man's album saying, hey, I'm sitting here waiting for this album, said his name, and, and he used to hang around with a lot of black rappers in the, in the fucking club, and they loved them. And it was like, all of a sudden, it was like, so which one of these are your true colors? Are you, and it's just like, no, his true colors are himself. He loves the applause. So right now he's getting the applause from a bunch of racist, and, uh, racist idiots, a bunch of... Um, uninformed black people and a bunch of rich people. So he's enjoying the applause. And if he could get more applause from black people, he'd be on the other side of the fence. He's a selfish, ignorant, disgusting, deplorable uh, piece of shit. And that and it's and it's mm-hmm. and it's sad that these the people who um the majority of the people who vote for him, he doesn't give a shit about him. Like Dave Chappelle has a joke. He goes he doesn't care about you. I'm rich. He cares about me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so that's the part that's really funny about it. And Chappelle hates him. Like, you know what I mean? But he's honestly like, oh, he doesn't care about you. So why are you voting for someone who legitimately does not care about you? What has he done for all the for all the people who voted for him? What has he done for them? Like, you know what I mean? Education still sucks. They're still removing, yeah. they're still taking money from um, education and funneling it to the military, like you know what I mean. So it's like he obviously doesn't care about you. So I don't get it. That, again, I went on a tangent. So do you remember the first time you actually went out and protested, and like, or like when you had a moment of clarity when you're like, I need to do more than what I'm doing now? Are you asking me or Maria? Oh, you. Sorry, I should probably, I should probably use names. Oh, okay, sorry, <laughs> it got kind of fuzzy. Um, well, in college, I got, actually, when I was really little, I was really into, um, animal rights and, uh, very against fur and animal testing, and and this was, like, when I was seven, eight years old, nine, and, like, I did a report on it and everything, and so I started, like, saving up money to donate to, like, anti-animal testing things, so that wasn't a protest, but it was definitely, like, charity work, political action, that kind of thing. Yeah. I like think I remember writing to Ed Markey asking him to outlaw fur when I was six or something. Or <laughs> No, it was about um, Gillette. Because Gillette was, uh, I was... I kept seeing as a little kid graphic images of what they would do to rabbits with these razors. And ever since, I banned Gillette and Procter & Gamble products from our house. <laughs> so I was in... I had an activist... Uh, altruistic activist gene, I guess. And then in college, I did some stuff uh, with a group called Students Taking Action Now for Darfur when there was the genocide in Darfur. And I just, I was like, it's an obligation that I, I am a middle class white girl who you know, has a wholesome face that can let me get away with a lot of things. And I haven't uh, experienced a great deal of hardship that didn't come from, like, mental illness stuff. And I always felt like I should use whatever I have, whatever I've been spared from, to, I don't know, I, I owe it 
to do that. So those are my first things, but I think protests, I don't think I went to any before Trump, sadly, but I was starting to get um, involved with a group called uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, which um, focused on ending uh, the oppression of Palestinians in Israel, because I think we have to clean our own house first, and or not first, but as well. Yes. And we of all people should, you know, see a apartheid society for what it is, and be instrumental in trying to dismantle that. It's just another manifestation of white supremacy that, and another uh, evidence that not all of us have learned from our own history. So, I mean, I think that those were my first protests, but the Women's March in 2017 was like my first big rally thing that I went to. Hey, it was funny, I was working at- And then I was like donate here or there whenever I could. Yeah. Etc. It was funny. I remember I was actually working um, at my other job uh, that I used, that I used to over by um, Fenway, and I remember the uh, my boss going, "Hey, just make sure you're vigilant, because uh, you know like there's a there's a women's right protest going on, so you gotta you know blah blah blah." And I'm like, I, "I'm I'm pretty sure we'll be fine. <laughs> this, this isn't this isn't the group of people you have to worry about that are gonna start breaking windows and come running into like my building, like you know." wreaking havoc, like, you're fine, but on the, but it's, but we also had the, um, those idiots who would protest the, uh, Jewish monument every year, and it, it was, it like, it I don't was, think I was there, which, uh, do you mean, like, the right-wing oh, psychos, no. when was that? This was, whoo, this was, um, if I was on, if I've been, if I was at the job for 15 years, that might have been 10 years ago. Uh, I probably still lived in Framingham then. I wasn't quite as in the loop. Trust me, give it a Google. You'll find it. It's it's disgusting. Mm. Um, and it might have been. It might have even have been called something else. But like we always knew that this was uh, a specific protest that was always going to like cause an uproar. And it was always funny that when it did happen, it was never the um, the people who were protesting against it. It was always the ones who were like, you know, the Holocaust didn't isn't real. It didn't happen. And it's like. You're a moron. <laughs> like it's, yeah. it's always the morons who don't really understand like what's going on. But like and it's and it's it's sad like how tone deaf they are about like if it was your rights that were being um, taken away, you feel a certain way about it. Um, we had a um, and so uh, I wanted to bring this up. There's uh, I tweeted something this morning, last night, whatever you want to call it, uh, about my wife, me and my wife in life. Uh, my wife is a scout. She's sharp, she's sharp, she's subtle, she gets to the point. I am a hammer. Everything looks like an, everything looks like a nail to me. That's just what it is. Now, what's funny is, since everything else is going on, the roles have flipped. She's become the hammer, and I've become a scalpel. And it's actually kind of, and it's... And I said, I was just like, my wife's awesome. Like, she's, like, she's heroic. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I take a softer, gentler approach to things. And she's, like, you know what I mean? She's shooting a um, rocket launcher of um, <laughs> sunset people. But, it, it need, but, like, they need to be hit by this. She's a lot braver than I am. Like, you know what I mean? Like, this is, I, I'm good at this, and I'm good at writing. Like I can like when people have people have come to me and they need they have questions like I can I can answer questions to you like it's funny how I can hold my emotion now it's fine but and it, like I always tell people like so my wife's seen it if someone attacks her in public it's like all right well now I'm gonna have to, now I'm gonna have to fuck you up but <laughs> but like but like verbally I'm like I don't worry about her <laughs> you need to you need to worry about her <laughs> like that's fine. But it's it's funny how like roles and dynamics change when intense situations come up. Um, like it's like um, like uh, your husband was in the military, right? Yeah, and he is always very anxious about my going to these things because he knows I get emotional and I have anxiety attacks if like if a cop were to come at me and 
pepper spray me. He's like, he's been pepper sprayed a lot. He had to be pepper sprayed a lot in training, and it was just another thing for him. And he's always so scared of me going into these groups because he's like, it only takes one person among the cops or amongst the crowd who has bad intentions to make everything go south and put you in serious danger. So I'm, I don't know, I have to, we've had a lot of arguments about it and I'm like, I can't in good conscience stay home, especially because we've both had and recovered from COVID, fortunately mild cases. Yeah. Uh, like months ago, we've gotten better. Um, so without that fear over my head, I don't really have a reason to stay away because I'm probably not the first person people are going to be, like, cops are going to be going after anyway, and the more people show up, the more, the less likelihood any one person is to get picked out, I guess, just law of averages. Like, yeah, the strength and, in numbers. Hmm? Strength in numbers. Yeah, I feel like I at least owe my presence. So, Especially if, if they shut down the T again, I could walk home from uh, downtown Boston. <laughs> So. But I also think it's uh, it's something that um, I I've spoken on. I'm pretty sure I've spoken on here. It's like having um, allies who who don't look like you, um, not like you, Lauren, but like look like me. So like my yeah. own girl Carol, she's Honduran, and and she's in the military. So she's mentioned that she can only say so much because of the situation she's in. But she's also said that she can't stay silent because like she knows like she knows oppression. She feels oppression. Not just as a woman, but also a woman of color. Yeah, so like, it's you know, a doubly. Yeah, and then on top of that, like she, um, she came to this country after being born in Honduras. So while she's a legal citizen, like in her English is fine, she still talks with an accent. So that's another that's another quote unquote strike against her because it's mm -hmm. not it's not what the typical racist American wants to see. Um, so. It's important, I think, that we uh, accept the allies that we have. Like, one of our favorite people, um, Laura, and I'm pretty sure you've interacted with her on my own Facebook page. Um, I won't say her last name on here, but um, she's uh, someone who always, like, she protests. She, um, she's always there for the pride parade. Like, she protests. She marches. She'll be the first one to say, you know, Black Lives Matter. She's also, like, someone who gets it. Like, you know what I mean? Gets it, but it's always a difference between uh, getting it and knowing that you don't get it. Like I don't, I understand that I understand women's rights, but I'm not a woman, so I don't really get it. I just get that it's a thing that you need, and I get that it's a, a really, it's a really terrible thing that you have to go through. You know what I mean? But for like, you know what I mean? I would be foolish to be like. I can do, we can do it all by ourselves. Like, no, we're in the minority right now, so we need people, we need the more help, the better. Like, you know what I mean? A helping hand is a helping hand, so. Yeah. So well, you would have been heartwarmed to see the the first uh, protest in Brookline that happened another, like, the week or so before. Uh, it was luckily led by uh, local black youth and assembled by them, but it was kind of, like, heartwarming to see like old blonde cheerleader teen types, heart like heartfelt yelling, "Say her name!" and leading the chance because they were probably just it's Brookline and it's super white and they had to have like chant colors throughout. So it was like, oh, they really give a shit and seeing like a dad and his little eight year old girl kneel, taking a knee and raising a fist and like just looking at us like, "Thank you for what you're doing." And it was like, oh my god! I mean, not me, but like the the mass of people. It was just. Lovely to see all the support from little old ladies waiting for Black Lives Matter to sign into their balconies. It was, it was sweet. And yeah, Brookline has its problems, but it was just nice to see that there and have so much support come out for it. I stumbled upon this march, and it was just rather lovely. Uh, it's good uh, to see that growing. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you're fine. You can. No, no, no. you're the guest. Talk oh, I'm, I'm all you want. Thought. No, talk all you want. Go ahead. Tell the story. Like, no, no, I, I finished the thought. It's fine. <laughs> um, so, okay. So how did? So how would you recommend anybody who wants to support? Like, explain how people can um, be a voice. Like, explain the multiple ways that people can actually, like, you know, do something to help. 
Well, I think you were going to talk about this later on, but like about the good and bad of social media. This is one case where social media can actually be really helpful because following uh, black and indigenous people of color, especially like black women and indigenous women, uh, like Rachel Cargill, um, Zerlina Maxwell, there's tons of others. I can't think Ijeoma Oluo, whose book, So You Want to Talk About Race, is essential. I just got the audio book of it, and I think I'm going to get a physical copy just so I can lend it to, to people. And it's just a really good primer, and it's a primer, but it's also in depth, so it gives you a really good, thorough basis that's also very digestible in what... Um, women of color especially have to deal with, black women especially have to deal with every day. And she also talks about internal biases within the community and what she's faced as someone who experienced poverty as a child, etc. She's a great writer. But reading uh, black writers and indigenous writers, uh, following them on social media, following their uh, the groups that are led by them, people who are actually experiencing these issues, it's important to follow their leadership because they've been in this fight far longer than any white folks have, and they know the fight much more intimately. And like donating to mutual aid funds, donating to bail funds, um, diversifying the people you follow on Twitter, uh, and yeah. learning there's so many materials for white allies on social media, like how to talk to your relatives or your friends or the person in your office talking about how if they say something racist but don't mean it that way, it's not always your intent. Your intent doesn't really matter to the person who's getting hurt by the things you're saying. Like how to have all these, how to start all these conversations. It's, those are the things that will really help white allies deal with, put our own house in order so our ignorant uncle or hairdresser or whatever, whoever we come into contact with who says some shit we don't like or stuff that you think, oh, maybe they're good people, but they just are misunderstanding this completely and they deserve to know different. If you can call them in, if you can, if they're not being super nasty, and if they are being nasty, you should still try to deal with it before any black people or other people have to deal with that because my day is not filled with that. Yours might be dealing with white people's bullshit. And we have to take that discomfort on ourselves and try to fix whatever we can. Or at least show that there are white people who care about this stuff and will think poorly of you for expressing such ignorant opinions. They have to know that there's consequences and then they might actually examine themselves. And I think that's a, that's a, a huge part of this is... Um, like I've had some people like there's a guy on Twitter like I literally just met with him like the last like four or five months we follow each other and he um, just tweeted I was like he um, hit me up I, was, I forget what I tweeted it doesn't matter but he was saying how he wanted to inform his family members about what they're doing was wrong and I offered as much advice as I can he goes I've tried that I've tried that he goes like he's like and I explained it to him and I, and I came down to it and I don't remember if I said this, but I, I feel like at some point, as much as it hurts, you have to start cutting people off. Like, Valkyrie yeah. has been cutting people off left and right. And honestly, Odin, cool, do it. Because, like, there's not really, like, for me, it's just like, you're going to have to delete me because I'm not going to stop talking about the shit I'm going to talk about. And if you hate that I'm talking about, like, how important this, this movement is, then either hide me or fucking delete me because I'm not going to stop. But Valkyrie, it's a little bit different for her. Like, you know, it's like, you know what? If you're not going to listen, then go fuck yourself. I don't even want I don't even want people knowing that I'm associated with you. Which I completely understand. But, yeah, um, I kind of felt like that about my uncle. Like, I didn't invite him or his wife to my wedding because he got much more... He used to be a really sweet, empathetic person, or at least I thought. And then he just got more conservative once he married this woman. And I... After things I'd heard her say and things he's uh, been fine with, clearly, by voting for Trump, I did not want him at our wedding because I just seeing him makes me so angry now and that he can be sanctimonious and think he has a leg to stand on morally just sickens me. And, like, as 
One of my favorite other podcasters, Dan Savage, says the only leverage you have over your family as an adult is your presence. And if they lose that, maybe that's the only thing that will get them to think about coming around. And if they don't, then at least you'll have that pain, that gnawing out of your head. Yeah. It's... Yeah, like, and it's and it's funny, like, um, I've cut people off from my family because it's like, I'm not with your ultra-religious way of life. I actually told a story to someone today when my dad was like, oh, you have to invite your uncle. And I laughed at him. He goes, I'm serious. I'm like, so am I. That's funny. Fuck him. <laughs> He's like, you know what I mean? He doesn't dictate anything I do. I've never liked him. I still don't like him. So no, I'm not going to invite him to my mm-hmm. wedding. I'm not inviting anybody that I don't care about. And yeah. I wouldn't be shocked if he voted for Trump. To be honest with you, like, he's an asshole. Like, he, like you know what I mean? He's a oh, never. I'm, yeah, that's that's another story for another day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can have an uncle bitching session later. Uh, I can't. I cannot stand that dude, man. He is just the fucking worst. Uh, <laughs> um, so let's move on to the, to another story that I like. I said the the, the story about wrestling that uh, that the gentleman talked about that he oh no something completely different something completely different that's not the that's not the Marvel thing. This is the wrestling thing. So, um, Valkyrie made I know. No, and we talked about this. Um, I guess the best way to go is speaking out trends as several top names in wrestling face in wrestling face sexual assault allegations. This is shocking and not all at once. It's shocking because uh, sexual assault and sexual misconduct in wrestling has been a thing for decades. Like that's not an exaggeration. Like in the eighties, I mentioned this on a podcast. Roddy Piper has talked about how other men would make, would like, you know, do certain things to him that were like, you know, sexual nature that made him uncomfortable. But, you know, for a lot of wrestlers, it's either take it or, you know, don't. Like, you know what I mean? Or get out the business. And it's called, like, you know, it's called um, harmless hazing. You know what I mean? And things, like that, and things like that. Um, Yikes. But the, it's, it's gotten, but, um, it's it is something in a culture that's never stopped. It's it's been like this for like I said for decades. But now you have a lot of people coming out and speaking. And I guess the hashtag has been uh, speaking out. S P E A K I N G O U T. Um, and they've been calling out people on blast. Like and while there are uh, while there are a lot of women, there are also a lot of men who are speaking out on this as well, which is shocking. Because, um, as Valkyrie, I'm pretty sure you can, can attest to this, it's really difficult to, for a man to admit that they were sexually assaulted by another man. Because it comes off like you're weaker. Well, why couldn't you stop them? It makes you less than a man if you couldn't do certain things. I mean, the same thing goes for women, though. I didn't say it. I didn't no, say I'm, it. Not I'm just saying, I'm just saying like, don't get offensive. Like, I'm just saying we understand that plight, that feeling. I'm not yeah. negating what you're saying. Relax. <laughs> no, I, 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 I get a little defensive because I remember telling someone that some woman like grabbed my dick on the train and their response was like, well, it happens to us all the time. I'm like, I agree, but that doesn't negate the fact that I was basically like, like groped on, a, uh, uncomfortably groped on the train. I, I couldn't wear basketball shorts for like years after that. Like, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I, it's a, I get defensive and I apologize for that. Um. But like, and it's, and then like you have, like, there are, there are, there, women have finally gotten a place in wrestling where they don't have to look like Victoria's Secret models to actually wrestle. Like you can actually be talented and, and you'll be successful. But Lord knows the stories that like they can tell. Uh, there's a woman named AJ Mendez. I forget her, her married last name, but she has a book called, um, Uh, something is my superpower. I'll, I'll look it up when um, we talk. But um, I remember listening to the book and she was explaining how she was stretching one day and one of the wrestlers was like ogling her. There's one thing you walk by, you see something, you just kind of keep moving. One guy was ogling her. And one of the male wrestlers grabbed him and slammed him up against the wall. And he was like, you are going to treat these women with respect. And so he came from a... Di- like he wasn't... He didn't come up in wrestling. He came up as an Olympic um, level athlete. Like, he was a power lift. So he didn't grow up in that culture where something like that was okay. And now imagine how disgusting that is, like, when you're, like, in a culture that's, like, you know, made, like, in, in his, in the way he was, demands respect, and you come in, and it's like, 
you guys just do this shit and it's okay. You know what I mean? So it's um so their name and so a lot of people are being named um being named. Uh, there's a woman named Piper Niven who's all spoken up about this. Um, there's a this disgusting wrestler named um, Velveteen Dream who um yeah that's his that's his name that is that is his name. Um, I'm sorry. It, yeah, t- trust me, the name is funny. Um, it was and talked about that and like he was like and like he was sending nasty direct messages and like um, allegedly I know the, the messages we saw were nasty because he it, like it, they've been con- almost all but been confirmed that he was sending nasty messages to underage. Um, I'm not sure if they're men or boy men or, I mean boys or girls, but it doesn't matter. They were underage. Um, and it's just, and I'm glad that it's actually coming um, to a place where you can actually like where like a lot of these like women and men have like finally spoken up and been like yo this is this is what the wrestling culture was or this is what it still is. Um, there was a promoter Jim Cornette who has been cited as uh, having wrestlers do sexual things for in front of or with his wife. If they wanted to continue doing business with them, you can you guys look it up. His name is Jim Cornette, and you can the people can look up the actual allegations. Um, but what makes it even better is like now you have a lot of other. Um, so what happens is now it's like you have these women speaking up. So now it's like okay, well I'm gonna speak up now, and so once and then that ball gets rolling, and all these people who shouldn't be um, idolized or looked at or even have their celebrity are now getting caught up in the shit that they're doing. Um, and the strength that these women have have empowered, like, you know, these other men who have been sexually assaulted to, like, you know, gain the courage to, like, go, I was also a victim of this as well, which will hopefully have, like, more men speak up, which will in turn have more women speak up, which will hopefully abolish this disgusting culture where you have to do something sexual in order to, like, prove that, prove your worth in a, um, in this, in, in um, the wrestling industry. Um, I'm not sure how much uh, you did, Lauren. Did you get a chance? Because I sprung this on you like five minutes before we started. I didn't really get to look much <laughs> up, but I. It just seems like you would think after Terry Crews came out and said that he had been sexually assaulted, that like you, no one could question Terry Crews's masculinity. Like you'd think he would have. That could have set a precedent for men, more men saying, "Yeah, this this fucking assault. It's about." It doesn't make me and I liked it or anything, and it's, I know, it shouldn't be, I guess, I don't know. I guess you always hope society evolves quicker than it does. Yeah. But then again, in such a hyper-aggressive, body-focused world as wrestling, which I, again, know fuck all about, but I know that basic thing, it's very, it's focused on the body and bodily aggression and domination it doesn't really surprise me that that's a prevalent thing there or more prevalent than had been let on it seems like it of course i mean if it were like curling then maybe i'd be a bit more surprised (laughs) because you don't think about the sexual assault inherent in the world of curling yeah so yeah (laughs) yeah like yeah it's it's bad um and i'm valkyrie you started to say something earlier like way earlier about the um the wrestling stuff um, before we even recorded. Like, what are your thoughts about uh, people finally speaking up? Like, this has been a trend for me the past, like, year, I want to say, with more, like, wrestlers speaking up. Okay, so again, like, wrestling is another major platform, just like Marvel, and I feel the same way. There is such a large group of number of people that this has all happened to. If all of them stood up and said something and formed together, like what we're trying to do now, it would make a difference like you if you continue to be complacent and watch things happen because you don't want to fuck up your money or your life or your career things are never going to change and people are going to continue to do things that hurt you that hurt others that that cause others like trauma and, and PTSD like for me there's a large facet of men and women in the wrestling community that this stuff is happening to 
that it's like, all right, speak up, say something, be loud. Don't worry about your paycheck. Don't worry about whatever. And I get that it's your livelihood, but there are always other options. You are not going to go hungry. You can get a job at friggin' JC Penny. Are you going to be able to afford your lifestyle? No, but if a whole group bands together, that's how you change things. That's what protests are about. That's what standing up and speaking out is about. Like sitting back and watching, like I, I could never work for a company and sit back and watch them do something so blatant and nasty and not say something if I knew what was going on. Even if it didn't affect me, say I, I, I've never been touched, I've never had to deal with it, it's never been my problem, I just go in, I do my thing, I get my money, and it has nothing to do with me. I've never, I've never had this issue. If my coworker comes to me and says, Maria, somebody did something inappropriate to me, they touched me, and another one comes to me again, and then another one comes to me again, and another one comes to me again, then I'm gonna stand up and say something because of the simple fact that they need help, they need a voice, they're afraid, they're scared. It's the same reason why I stand up for you when I say stuff, like for, for you or being black, like somebody was like, well, why blah, 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 and I'm like, I, I'm standing up right now for this because the people that it affected can no longer speak, right? Like Breonna Taylor cannot speak anymore, like, the million, the, the you, seven, Trayvon Martin the, cannot speak the, for himself. The so seven people who were just hung, who cannot they, who speak they're, who they're for themselves. Ruling yeah. and suicide. So, like for me, with this whole wrestling thing, it's the same thing. People are sitting back quietly, not saying anything because it doesn't affect them, and they're afraid of losing their fucking money because all America is built on is how much money you have and what stuff you have. I'm just not a believer of stuff. I'm not. <laughs> I, I don't believe my paycheck is more important than somebody else's sexuality, somebody else getting raped, somebody else being harmed, somebody else being hurt. My paycheck's not worth that. I understand. I'll get a job somewhere else. I agree 100%. <laughs> I guess what it really what it sometimes what it comes down to is um, you also have people who uh, who are like they have like dreams, they have goals, and but uh, there's a wrestler who brought up a good point where she was like, I deleted. My, um, she said she deleted her um, WWE um, network when she found out that the, um, the when like the WWE kept going to Saudi Arabia, and they were like, she was like, no, I can't, um, I can't ride with that. When she, when it was just like, like you know, we, we know about the nastiness that's going on in Saudi Arabia, how they really don't give a shit about the women there, and I, and um, like you know what I mean, like it, it's, it's that it's their way or no way. I think that's nasty. The WWE has has a contract with them, um, and honestly, like I run, I watch wrestling just because it's a conversation I can have with my best friend. He hates <laughs> wrestling. He absolutely hates wrestling, but like he like he hates it. But like he was just like, you know what? Right now, it's extra money that he needs. Right now, he goes, but as soon as he doesn't need it, he's done. Like you know what I mean? Like, and I understand that he's got a family support. Like you know what I mean? And he's look, he's actively actively looking to find and um a new way to make more money because he hates it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, and he's told me, like, he feels, like, you know what I mean? Like, well, not even just him. Like, people have told me how dirty they feel covering this stuff. Like, you know what I mean? But the good thing about it is, back to the whole Marvel thing, is, like, you have um, other outlets now. Like, you can be an independent wrestler and make a good, and make a good living. You may not make the um, 750000 or, uh, you know, the big bucks that a lot of people make, but you're still getting out your dream. Like, if I never become a million dollar writer, I, I can honestly still say, I can put on my resume, I am a writer. I am a podcaster. This is what I do. Like, you know what I mean? I can say things like that. So, to Valkyrie's point, she's right. And it's a lesson I had to learn when um, I wasn't, like, when I started making a little more money and realizing that, like, it isn't everything. It isn't everything I need. Like, you know, I mean, like, like I live... We live way below our means. And she reminds me all the time, like, you know, you can go buy stuff. I'm like, I was like, I buy comic books. <laughs> I don't need I don't need Jordans. I don't need a new pair of jeans. Like I my money goes to comic books and random t shirts and video games. And like vacation. Yeah, and vacation. We've I've gone to Hawaii twice. Some people will never go. I've been twice. Because they're more concerned with having a five bedroom house and a white picket fence and a twenty thousand dollar wedding? 
No, not even, no, 20,000 mark? Do you know what people pay for weddings nowadays? No. <laughs> I don't know what people pay for weddings. No. Mine was 50, under 10,000, I think. It's Kelly, so was ours. We, we spent 20, restaurant. No, we spent 16,000 total with everything, including our, like, vacation. Yeah. Our, like, it was everything. But the, the majority of weddings start at, like, Thirty thousand dollars. What? The most of them are around like fifty. The higher end ones go to like a hundred thousand dollars. That is nasty. Oh, the wedding industry. We can do yeah. that a whole another day. Oh no, the wedding industry. The <laughs> we wedding, can do that a whole. That could be a whole another topic. The wedding industry needs to be a whole thing where it's not even just the wedding industry; it's the funeral industry as well. Oh, gross. oh god. Yeah. Oh. But yeah, no, those are a whole other things. Lord, if you yeah. want to be in for that one, you can have you can be in for that one. <laughs> sure. I just, I guess, I just, I just, I, I don't, I don't understand people that like the WWE is all those things too, right? Vince McMahon is Vince. openly a Trump supporter. A Trump supporter. He openly made stereotypical characters that he's still doing. It pisses me off to no end, and we've had this conversation. We've had this is conversation. Leathery looking guy. The what? Is he that leathery looking guy who's in all the gifts? Who's just terrifying looking? Oh no! Oh, no, I know what you're talking about. But he, he, white that... hair, like I know, gray hair, white guy, leathery as hell, looks insane. Oh, Ric Flair. <laughs>
So for me, it just I just thought Kristen Ritter was not the best choice. I feel like they could have went with somebody else. Uh, Valkyrie's always she said a good job though. She, I mean, she did do she did a decent job. Um, she was a little. I, yeah, I, I read like I read all the Jessica Jones comics. Like, like I, I mean, I guess yeah. I, I still I don't know. At least something for me. I wasn't a big fan of the show though either. But that was just me. I just didn't. So, I think it was that great. I'm sending you an image of Jessica Jones now. One of my favorite images of Jessica Jones. What? Um, yeah. I, sent it, I sent it to Lauren. All right, so, and I know what Lauren's going to say to this. So, Lauren, Han Solo or Batman? <laughs> Han Solo. <laughs> She's like, hands down. Batman's, <laughs> uh, uh, Marjorie, you going? <laughs> Batman's a spoiled, pretentious dick. Han Solo. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Mario or Luigi? Oh, my God, you know who could play her? You cool. know who could totally play her? The, um... Rachel Bloom. I would crazy ex girlfriend. She looks kind of like Rachel Bloom. Kind of. If Rachel Bloom, unfortunately, if Rachel Bloom. In would, that picture. Yeah. If Rachel Bloom. Oh. Would, yeah, this is the picture I sent her. Rachel Bloom would have to give a little bit more of the bitch, though. Yeah. She, yeah. I think she'd have to. She needs to see. I like. I'm sorry. I like Kristen Ritter's attitude because it makes sense towards the Jessica yeah. Jones character. I just the it was the cavity wasn't there. Yeah, like and the fact that they had to put like ten thousand layers of giant clothes on her to make her be like something that she was. I, it was just weird to me. Like it was like a little kid playing dress up. Like, <laughs> it was just all. I and I know that's I, and I'm, I know that I'm like one of the only people who have that opinion. But if it doesn't hurt my feelings, that nobody agrees with it. It's just I just did not. I see what you mean. It just. It's like reading your favorite book and then seeing it portrayed on television and being like, what the fuck? <laughs> this and is not what I envisioned. And opportunity to cast a woman of an average size, and obviously they didn't. Yeah. yeah. It's like finding out... No, J- it's not like they're... It's like finding out J.K. Rollins is, uh, J.K. Uh, Rollins is, uh, transphobic. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Mario or Luigi? I'm gonna have to play the fifth because I don't know enough about. I've never played Mario or I've seen the terrible movie. Oh God! Moving on. Moving on. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is why I can't go for the, the the dinosaur head guys. <laughs> so at least that's interesting to me. Uh, uh, Shrek or Aladdin? Shrek. Huh. Shrek or who? Aladdin. 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 I think Shrek. I think I'm on Shrek as well. Like I, I love the story of Shrek. Like I, it's one of my yeah, favorite. Yeah, I agree. Stories. I love Shrek. Yeah. Um. I'm like an onion. I have layers. I have layers. <laughs> All right. You I'm, you know, I'm gonna save this one for last. Uh, Thanos or Cable? Who's the second one? Cable from the Deadpool movie. Hmm. I'm going Cable, but only because I'm biased. I'd go for Thanos because I don't remember the second. I don't remember the Deadpool movie cl- clearly enough. <gasps> I'm sorry. Be still, my heart. I haven't seen it in a while. By Thanos and Cable. Though. They both played by Josh Brolin. Oh. Oh, which which portrayal I liked more? Yeah. That's really hard. He did a really good job with both characters. Oh yeah. Like like an excellent job with both characters. So I don't know if I could. That's not fair. Again, that's another one of those you can't pick. Oh, I'm thinking Cable. He was. So you think he did a better Cable than a better Thanos? Yeah, like he was. One of my favorite parts of the movie was Deadpool went to hug him, and all you heard was a snake noise, and Deadpool was like, "Is that a knife on my dick?" And Cable goes, "That's a knife in your dick." <laughs> um, I don't remember this. It, it's towards the end. Of, it's towards the end of Deadpool too. All right, and last question, Lauren. This is for all the marbles. You can win the game that has no points if you answer correctly. <laughs> Amelia Earhart or Joan of Arc? Uh, God, I feel worse for Joan of Arc. <laughs> well. But I'm not religious, so I think I'd have more to talk about with Amelia Earhart. <laughs> they, I don't know what to base this on. I don't know. I just I randomly came up with this as we were doing this. I'm like, you know what? I'll have a little game of this or that to end this with a little more fun. Why not both? Okay. Oh, can we go with this? <laughs> right. We can have everything. That's the whole point of this whole podcast. Inclusivity. <laughs> I will say, best silent movie I've ever seen 
The Passion of Joan of Arc. Oh, I don't think I've ever seen that. Really? I haven't even heard of it, actually. If you want a good cry, watch that. No, I don't, I don't want a good cry. No, okay, look. I know. I am tired of crying in movies and true, having my true. wife make fun of me of it. <laughs> okay, so I, 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 I may have mentioned this on the show before, but I cried in Toy Story. I cried watching Toy Story 4. Like, there was a moment it was just, like, so happy, and it's got, got my emotions going. And she looked at, my wife looked at me and goes, are you crying? I was like, don't judge me. It was a happy moment. I, was, I started crying in the beginning of, like, The Greatest Showman because, like, all, I'm a happy crier. I don't cry during sad scenes. I'm a happy crier. When something really happy happens in a movie, I cry. If something sad or, like, messed up happens, I just get angry. I'm a happy crier. Leave it at that. I'm sticking to it. Alright, this has been the Old Man Wade Show. Uh, I want to thank my lovely life, Valkyrie, for doing this. Uh, Lauren, uh, thank you for doing this. I really, 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 really can't wait till this shit is over so you can actually do this in person. Uh, we will have we will have wine, we will have beer, we will have uh, conversations, and uh, it won't maybe be... Maybe some cheese. Maybe some cheese. <laughs> <laughs> maybe some cheese. Um, if you'd like, would you like people to find you on, in, on social media or not? Uh, sure. On social media, my uh, Instagram is probably the only thing worth following because I'm only on Twitter now and then to retweet other stuff. And my Instagram is Leia's Legacy 84. I think. Let me let me check. I think there's an 84 there. Yeah. I. You know what's funny? Uh, no, it's uh, just Leia's Legacy. I love. For me, like. If... I'm just giving away that I'm 36. <laughs> <laughs> I, one of my favorite things about that is about your page is like all the uh, the nature pics. Yeah, I have to break up the sad stuff because I mean flowers are the only thing I get to see around while just walking around, especially during the quarantine when all I could do is just go for a little neighborhood walk, get some fresh air. Yeah. So yeah, I break up the activism stuff with dogs and nature, <laughs> and sometimes history, fun mm-hmm. stuff. Nature. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll do this again. Uh, Valkyrie, where can people meet you? On my living room couch? I don't know. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, Duke, you have anything to add? Duke? He doesn't care about you. Yeah, Duke doesn't care about us right now. Damn it, Wade!